Hey, what's up everyone? I am your host, Sethi. I am stylist Rashi Bindra. Elevated Grapes is a digital media hub that includes a talk show, event correspondence, and digital hosting for partner projects. The talk show which you are listening to or watching, depending on what you're doing, covers topics in fashion, business, and lifestyle. We regularly have incredible guests that share their stories, their experiences, and tips on the above topics. And when we don't, you get to hear how we talk to each other off air. So subscribe to your favorite streaming site, YouTube, and Instagram for behind the scenes and additional visual content. Let's jump right into the show. Welcome to Elevated Graves. This is the Elevated Graves Podcast. Elevated Graves Podcast. With your host, Seth. Your host, Seth. And stylist, oh, yeah. Rashi Bindra. It's time to get started. Let's talk fashion, shall we? <laughs> Leslie Hampton was a third culture kid, and her early life was of constant relocation. Her formative years were spent in Canada's Arctic, Atlantic, Australia, England, Indonesia, and New Caledonia, adding to her quest to establish a personal and cultural identity. Long before her professional career started, Leslie was an ambassador for equality, diversity, and proper representation of both beauty standards and culture within the industry. The advocacy coupled with her artistic passion and ability naturally took shape through what is now known as her namesake brand, Leslie Hampton. Welcome, Leslie. Let's dive right in. Leslie, tell us about yourself and especially how your background and your mixed heritage played a role in being who you are today. Yeah, so I have a really mixed background. Um, I am Indigenous. I uh, am a member of Tomogamy First Nation located in Northern Ontario. Um, but my family and myself, we didn't grow up in the culture. Um, and my parents met in Montreal and then I was born in Newfoundland. Um, so just right from the start, uh, very all over the place. Um, and then from there, uh, I had the privilege of going to middle school in Australia and high school in England um, with uh, Indonesia and New Caledonia uh, spread in the mix as well. Um, so I call myself a third culture kid um, because I have all these experiences and all these international cultures uh, that I've grown in and grown from. Um, and then coming back to Canada and figuring out what it meant to be an Indigenous woman in, in, uh, in this time, in this day and age, it was really, really difficult for me to figure out who I was with, um, with all these different background experiences and really defining it for myself and defining my indigeneity for myself. Uh, was a really big, big adventure for me, and still is. So, so hold on. Let's let's recap just for our listeners, so we because we can get all those get all those in there. So, indigenous background. Um, I heard Australia in there. I heard Indonesia in there. Like, repeat those again, just because there there's so many awesome places that you got to spend your time. Yeah. So, starting in Canada, Newfoundland, yeah. Calgary, Yellowknife, North Coast Territories, um, and then Australia, New Cal New Caledonia. Indonesia and England. Okay, so like and, then, and then to Toronto. Newfoundland and Calgary like, are so separate and so different on their own. So, I mean, all these amazing experiences that you got really must have been such an incredible experience to be around that all those different those different environments. Exactly. Um, and when I was living in Northwest Territories, um, it was the first time that I kind of discovered that I was Indigenous and I was different than than a, a Caucasian person. Um, and it was actually pointed out to me by uh, my blonde haired blue eyed friend saying, oh, Aboriginal day, this is for you. And I was like, what does that mean? Like I'm yeah. the same as you, aren't I? <laughs> and then going from there and then having all these different experiences and then coming back to Canada and uh, with the, the media is really kind of where I discovered all these stereotypes around indigenous people and they don't really teach you in school, especially international school, um, what, in what indigenous people are and how, how we, uh, it's very stereotypical. Um, so to discover who I am and, and my indigeneity uh, through fashion, especially when it was uh, exciting mm -hmm. and it still is, yeah. So, so I'm gonna ask a question just because before we dive into the fashion side of this conversation. So you, you studied a little bit here in Canada as well. Yes. And, um, and abroad. So, sorry? And abroad as well. Yes. 
So you mentioned that, you know, having learning about your indigenous background overseas was obviously not as prevalent because it, maybe it's not as, as known uh, overseas, whereas Canada, it's, it's quite, a, you know, it's quite prominent uh, part of our culture, right? So what was the differentiation you saw in terms of studying here and learning a little bit about it or seeing it a bit more in the day-to-day versus, and even in our history books, I mean, we learn about it versus, you know, when you were, when you were abroad. Yeah, uh, in elementary school in Canada, um, they never taught you about modern day indigenous people and, and what the incredible indigenous people of today are doing. Um, it was always from the 1700s or, 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 or um, very long, like very historical references. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and then going to middle school in, Aus- in Australia, uh, Australian Aboriginals have their whole a whole different uh, history around them. Um, and so identifying as an Aboriginal or an Indigenous person, but that's identif- uh, calling myself that uh, in Australia was again, vastly different because it was difficult to figure out the, the background uh, for myself out there. Um, so it was, it's, it was very interesting to come back and hear the stereotypes in the news, but then also be invited into this incredible uh, community of Indigenous people within fashion and, and within uh, the arts, um, especially in Toronto, um, and, and discovering who I am from that. Right, of course. So, so let's, let's sort of dive this, I mean, we got, we got the background, which I think was really important to set that tone for, for our audience. So let's sort of dive now into your current world. So what does it mean to you to be known or considered as Indigenous, uh, as an Indigenous brand? And how has that label played a role in your success or played any factor in your success uh, as a brand? Yeah, uh, I identified from, from the foundation, from the, from the foundation of our brand, I identified as an indigenous owned brand. Um, and our concepts for collections are always very conceptual um, and very, they, they, I always have a, have a, messaging behind them or some sort of storytelling aspect to my collections. Um, and that's very, very on par with, with indigenous culture and we are oral storytellers or visual storytellers. Um, so it was almost natural for me um, in that sense. And then being involved in aspects like Indigenous Fashion Week Toronto or Vancouver Indigenous Fashion Week uh, is, is a great way to uh, bring the two world, the indigenous uh, background and fashion world together um, and really learn about who I am from all these other amazing Indigenous uh, artists and designers. So, so Leslie, how did that start for you though? Because I mean, we've like covered your like, you know, background and, and what you're doing today, but wh- like, like, where was that bridge? You like came back to Canada and you, you, you came to Toronto and were you like, okay, like I want to get into the fashion world or the arts world. Like how do you kind of merge the two together? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so when I came back to Canada, I didn't quite know what I wanted to do for university. Um, and my parents were relocating to back to the Toronto area. So I, I followed in their footsteps. Um, and I attended the University of Toronto. Um, and I was always very creative. So I, I went in for uh, art studio and art history, just to discover more about that world. Um, and I noticed that through all my artworks, they were all um, around the body and the conversation with with what you put on your body and what that what that communicates um, in a in a broader sense. Uh, so it was I was always studying appearance and 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 uh, notions around that. Um, so it was almost a natural jump over to fashion um, from from that undergrad degree. Uh, so then from there, uh, I knew I wanted to do fashion, but I. My, my sewing skills weren't the best. So then I started at George Brown College uh, for fashion techniques and design. And I was really eager to start. So I uh, started my brand the first few weeks I started school. And I took what I was learning in class and in the evening time brought it straight into my brand to produce those clothing items. So it was wow. almost simultaneous wow. as you were learning and you're applying. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's the best way because literally some of the things we learned like in high school and university, I can't remember for the life of me. So, if, <laughs> so to, to apply it right away is probably the best, the best thing you could have done. <laughs> exactly. But I, but I just love how you said that 
even though my sewing skills weren't the best, I'm going to go learn it and start applying that. And I think that's, that speaks so much, you know, in terms of like strength and character, because we all, you know, go through that phase where if we're not good at something or we're not good at a technical skill of it, we, we tend to hide away and we tend to like run away from it and find different ways to, to like get involved in that industry if we feel called to it. But you were just like, I don't know how to sew, but I'm going to go learn it and I'm going to start applying it and I'm going to start at that age. And, and I think that speaks um, volumes about who you were then and what you have created now as well. Mm -hmm. There was always a, I always had a few issues with aspects around the the norm of what is beautiful within the fashion industry. Uh, and that's really what all my artwork was about uh, in my university career. So I had such a drive and a vision to change the fashion industry for the better and make it more body positive um, that that I just couldn't wait to graduate before I started the brand, um, which kind of messed me up at the beginning um, because I was I ended up skipping school to put on a fashion show. Um, <laughs> but it all well done that. that I guess. <laughs> but but like that's the best part, right? That just shows how much passion and how much love you have, not only for what you saw back in those days that designers are doing today or or designers started you know last year or like in or like two years ago actually I should say but you saw this vision about how we need to change the the stereotype in fashion years ago mm -hmm. so that's before, so, before it was a yeah. before it was a trend I mean to, you know, it now, trendy, now yeah, it's, yeah, yeah it's trendy exactly, <laughs> exactly quote unquote so so talk to us a little bit about that because I mean for you it was, it was a that was part of your passion in, in, in fashion. Like you didn't do it for a trend. You didn't do it because it was the right thing to do or the cool thing to do. Like you did it because it, it meant something. So how, what is, what role does body positivity play in, in your branding? Um, so for our audience, so they get an understanding and where do you think it, it stands now just in, in, in the fashion industry in general? Mm -hmm. uh, so as a brand, we're focused on mental health awareness, body positivity and authentic representation. Um, in fashion, film, and media. So right from the beginning, I didn't see why the typical runway model was always always one size and it was always a smaller size. Um, so so right from the beginning, I, I wanted to push that push that envelope even further. Um, and then for one of my showcases in 2018, uh, we casted all our models for the runway show based on. Um, on their mental strength. So it was all models who identified with mental illness and uh, were strong enough, uh, were, were able to overcome, overcome that. And I wanted that runway show to uh, be casted based on the strength of the model as opposed to their waist size and their waist measurement. Mm -hmm. um, so I really wanted to push that norm forward and show all aspects of beauty, um, regardless of your size and inclusive of your size. That's a really interesting concept. We're going to take a quick break right there and we're going to come back and I think continue a bit of that conversation on select the model selection process and how that played a role the way you did it for, for your brand and your shows. So you listen to Elevated Grapes. We have Leslie Hampton and we'll be right back. Hey everybody, this is Stylist Rashid Bindra. Do not forget to catch us on Ruckus Avenue. Also, you can hear us on the Dash Radio app every Saturdays at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So everybody, welcome back. We are chatting with the amazing Leslie Hampton and the, her story is just incredible and we have a lot more to share. Absolutely. So before we took our break, we were having a discussion around your model selection process and you do it based on mental strength versus waist size. That's a one, a very bold move. Um, you know, it's, it's, and especially in, in an environment where fashion is based on so many stereotypes as we talked about earlier. Um, it could be a challenging move too. So I would love for you to talk about the benefits and the, the positive experiences you saw from that, but also on the flip side, the challenges, because you know it was innovative and it was something different at the time for, for a fashion industry um, person to be using this method to, to build. Yeah, absolutely. Um, our, yeah, so my collection building always begins with a concept, with a, with a messaging that I wanna put out uh, with the clothes that I design and with the runway show that we put on, um, 
and also is translated through uh, the styling ideas that we put into the lookbook um, and any imaging that goes out for the, for the, sh for the collection. Um, so what I really loved pre-COVID when we were able to put on runway shows um, is that I always had those runway models in mind um, when producing the sizes of the samples. Um, so based on the concept that I wanted to put out into the into the world, um, that's I, I almost pre-casted my models before even developing the samples, um, depending on depending on the collection. Um, so uh, like we were saying, I had one collection that was inspired by uh, that that was ca I cast the models based on their on their mental strength. Um, I've had uh, runway shows that were casted uh, for anyone who identified. Uh, being indigenous, um, I wanted to show a wide range of of what indigenous people actually look like, and not that stereotype that Pocahontas yes. or uh, right. Blue that give you. Um, so those were all very successful uh, with the response that I received, um, and it's really just so that I can show that authentic uh, representation of these individuals, and they deserve a place on these amazing runway shows um, and amazing fashion weeks. Um, and just because they don't fit into a mold that was created in the 70s, 80s, and 90s doesn't mean they shouldn't be on the runways today. Um, and it's it's a little difficult because I was doing this before it was trendy. Um, so I've had models who were uh, in the size, in the, in the plus size range, getting turned away at the backstage door because they didn't look like runway models. Right. And the security guards were saying, why are you here? Like, you're not, like, this isn't the, the, the entrance to the show. Oh, like um, at, you, at your shows? At my shows, yeah, like turned away at the guide. backstage. So they weren't even able to enter backstage without me going to the security door and saying, yes, they're yeah, ready, yeah. let them in. Yeah, yeah, oh my um, goodness. That's so, so crazy. Yeah, it... But it puts it into perspective and it makes it all like so real. Like, that's that's why you're doing this, right? Exactly, and I've had models who had uh, who had a therapy dog companion, and that there was a big issue around letting the dog backstage to calm the model, uh, to keep the model at ease. So that that was very interesting as well. That to break these norms that people aren't used to seeing, the, uh, to, that I identify with being a model. So it's it's interesting to push these, but I, I can't wait that when when it's just a typical backstage world. It's, it's normal, but it, it's still, I mean, a lot of these, the stereotypes and or, you know, factors that make someone different are still a big issue or challenge within, within the industry, especially for, especially if we targeted runway models. I mean, I think it's changing a bit for, for print and other types of modeling, but I mean, not fast enough, but especially specifically with runway models, you know, you find this, we, we read recent stories too, Rash, and I think we read an article, it was last week, um, which we, we commented on a bit that, you know, even just someone with a, a slightly different last name with a slightly different cultural background, yes, yes. right? You know, things like that are still prevailing. So, so mm -hmm. what, what does that make you feel? What does that make you think about, you know, from the perspective of someone who's been trying to make that change and continually, you know, advocating for that kind of change? What do you feel about when you hear things like that in the fashion industry? Uh, it's, it's upsetting because as a head of a fashion brand or like a cr creative director of a fashion brand, um, it's your, your choices are put on such a pedestal, um, given a, given a fashion week show or given a, a billboard. Um, so the designer's choices, even based on, on what size run they produce in, in the particular clothing item. Yes. Um, those choices are then translated and trickled down uh, through the magazines and through the, um, through the advertisements. And then are, they end up with vulnerable eyes on them and designers are given such a, such a power to change society and to change those norms. Um, and it's disappointing that these designers, especially the ones who've been around for a while, aren't doing more to push uh, the world into a more positive direction and are just comfortable mm -hmm. with their with their cookie cutter norm. Um, so it's it's upsetting to see, but it's nice to see that it is changing a little bit and right. new designers are coming in and pushing that envelope. And do you feel it's, it's because there's been this, um, you know, standard perception of runway beauty? Because if we look back, you know, over the years, 
the models, they had to almost like, like they were at some point really just called the um, hangers Mm -hmm. for the designers, right? They were just like walking hangers. They just had to be able to have the outfit and go on. Yet model, sorry, yet designers wanted specifically, like specific beauty models to kind of like do it. So it it's it's a contradiction on its own because if beauty is subjective and if and if and if art is is really about expression, mm-hmm. and then we say fashion is art, why aren't our models kind of representing that? Oh, exactly. just a, yeah, exactly. So food for thought there, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so why did you get into I, no, no, I, I, or how did you get into slow fashion? Because I know um, a lot of designers, when they get into this industry, like like they want to create, but then they want to sell. They want to and they want the fame. They kind of want it all at once. And they do end up going into that whole fast fashion. You know, I'm doing kind of what everybody's doing so people can pick up on my brand and push it. But you went again, from the beginning, a very completely different direction that people are now, again, going back to. So what what called you to starting Slow Fashion? Yeah, uh, our signature collection right from the beginning uh, was always made to order. Um, so we did our, our samples in, in a range of sizes because then we can, uh, any stylist who wanted to pull pieces for our collection and have the work in magazines to, to raise our name um, could do so. But other than those sample items, um, we were always made to order. Um, so the money came up front and then we produced the piece and specific to the, um, the client's needs and size. And size. Um, so that, that's kind of how we started. And then um, in 2018, we started uh, our athleisure collection, our, our athleisure collection. Um, and that we did small size, uh, small, um, production runs to to stick to the slow fashion and we produced one collection in 2018 one collection in 2019 um, and and then one collection in 2020 so we weren't trying to battle this fast fashion I think fast fashion's up to 52 seasons a year or something like weekly like that um, so we were definitely pushing away from that and and producing items uh, in a in a slow sense, um, but really quality items as well, um, making sure yeah. that quality for garments are there. Um, and then now, uh, with <laughs> with everything up in the air, 2020, 2021, um, we combined our signature collection and our and our ath, uh, le- athleisure to be our ath luxury collection. So uh, it's the those signature items as well as um, athleisure items all mixed together within the same concept and, and vision. That's really cool. So actually mm-hmm. you bring an interesting point. I'm going to jump mm-hmm. uh, a little bit in terms of where we want where, you know, this question was going to come a little bit later. Um, but in recent conversations we've had even with other designers, you know, the, the concept of fast fashion or seasonal fashion, as you mentioned, where you know, they're making multiple uh, lines for different seasons and different parts of the year has really changed because, I mean, all the seasons are kind of meshing to a degree. Everyone's Mm -hmm. spending a lot more time at home. There's fashion is changing and the way we, you know, we think about fashion is changing. How does that impact you? Like, I mean, if you, if your concept has always been slow fashion or, you know, you're not going to adhere to those norms of what designers are doing. How do you think, how has that impacted you and your branding um, with what's going on now versus the way you would operate prior to COVID? Yeah, uh, it actually allowed us to be more flexible. Um, And with COVID happening and the uh, uh, typical fashion weeks not being able to be uh, hosted, we we don't, we we aren't constrained to that uh, February and September release dates. Um, So it's one been really good for my mental health, not trying to keep up up with that uh, that fashion cycle. Um, So that's been really, really a a positive side of COVID, I guess. Um, And then, focusing going back to back to my roots where the creativity is the driver versus the commodity based structure of fashion being the driver um but going back to that creativity is is allowing me to to expand my mind and really put more ideas um and and replenished ideas and into the those collections for sure we're chatting with leslie hampton this is elevated grapes i'm going to jump in there and take a quick break and we'll be right back and continue the conversation yeah guys that was my line 
<laughs> hey guys, it's your host, Sethi. We're also on TikTok, so make sure you follow us there at Elevated Grapes. Cheers and back to the show. Blah. Hey everybody, welcome back to Elevated Grapes. We are talking with Leslie Hampton. I get to do the intro this time because Sauter did steal my line before. <laughs> <laughs> well, you started off with a blah, so I thought that was pretty genius. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Whatever. Let's just move on. <laughs> Um, Sardar, when do you follow up with this question? Yeah, for sure. I, I was waiting for your to be complete. I didn't want to steal your line again. You know, just want to be. Just want to go. Be... Just, okay. just jump right in. <laughs> so, so we were talking so before the break. We were talking about um, the impact of. I mean, generally, your your brand is considered slow fashion. Um, you don't adhere to the norms of what a fashion designer would. Um, COVID has kind of, you know, changed that a little bit for a lot of designers and the industry in general. You give us a little bit of background as to what what the impact of that meant to your brand just before the break. But talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing in the industry uh, in general with the impact of COVID and designers having to slow down and change the way they approach their lines. Mm -hmm. It's exciting to see that designers are releasing uh, their athleisure or athleisure collections as well, or their um, leisure lines. Um, I find that it's designers are starting to get creative with it. And it's not just a, a sweater and a track bottom they have yep. like <laughs> like a skirt that you can chill on the couch in or, or yes. something like that so seeing that creativity is really exciting um and it's going to be exciting once we are out of lockdown and perhaps the once the weather gets better and we are able to walk around and actually be seen again um so i think perhaps that might go in two different directions where people will <laughs> go out to a dinner in in the track outfit a track suit outfit or they're gonna go completely the other way and want to be glam all the time so i think both those right. clients and both those customers are there so i think it'll be very interesting to see how designers take that and what they end up producing um once once the vaccination is out there and we get to see and we get to see each other again <laughs> well it's also allowing brands like uh bernie sanders mittens to get some limelight <laughs> in the fashion world too, right? <laughs> exactly. And I think what they auctioned for, I don't even know what, $700 or that's so yeah, something, something incredible. So I mean, good, something good high, so, yeah, good on that uh, little uh, cool. that designer, right? Mm -hmm. So, well, so, apparently like people were like asking her for like her more, like for her to make those middens because they were from recycled materials. And she yeah. was just like, I, I, I can't, I, I can't make that much quantity by myself. Yeah. It was, it was ridiculous. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. The idea of one of a kind designs uh, yeah. is incredible as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you can't overlook that. Right. Cause it's, I mean, some people think, Oh, well, you know, one of a kind, I'm not going to sell as much. I'm not going to, you know, my brand's not going to go, but like it really takes one situation, one instance for it to get noticed. And then bam, like you're, you're a, a household name across the world. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so let's touch on, so in the same light with respect to the current times and what's going on. So we talked about, you know, some of the things that you've seen change immediately for you, some of the things we've talked about that are happening in the industry. How do you see this, the impact of all this in the evolution of your brand going forward and sort of long-term? I mean, obviously nothing's set in stone and things could change mm -hmm. tomorrow just like they did, you know, just over a year ago here. But from what you're seeing today, how do you see the evolution of your brand building forward? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you can thank I... Rashi for that. It was her, it was her question. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm still in the building phase of figuring out what is next. Um, from from this time, even what, we're in February, even this time last year, I really, I was still in that go, 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 must like do this and do that to, to stay competitive um, within the fashion industry. I, I, I had that mindset. And then now I am I, with so much time alone and so much uh, self thought and self reflection. I. I realize that I don't need to be competitive with people. I just have to show the best of what I am. And uh, we have the, the the fans and the followers and the supporters there that um, I think that's what they wanna see as well as my, my true authentic self. Um, and that translated within the brand. Um, so I, I think I'm still in the building phase for that one, but it's, it's exciting to see, to, to feel that I can go beyond fashion almost um, and, and see what 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 this brand can can go and go develop into and leslie and and before we get into the um 
partnership, the award partnership that you have with the uh, Ontario Mining Association. Okay. Um, where do you see just fashion in general, like the luxury, slow fashion headed in the city of Toronto, as well as on a global scale? Like, where do you feel it's, 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 it's going towards, just mm -hmm. given everything? Yeah, g given that people are, are looking and focusing more uh, the made at home or the, the locally made or locally designed items, I, I think there might, once we are able to gather again, I think there might be a spike in, in the, the uh, local luxury market um, and going away from the, the, the big names that, that everyone knows and focusing on those Canadian brands will be really exciting, I think. Um, and with everyone online more, I think there's more discovery uh, that's happening uh, with brands and I even during COVID time my my followers uh, on Instagram and, and uh, our our uh, newsletter list uh, has skyrocketed just with everyone on home and, and searching uh, different designers and talents up um, so I think I think that focus to to Canadian made and, and locally made is, is going to be interesting uh, interesting and still push forward uh, even once we're out of COVID yeah I I, I... I, I'm seeing that as well. I, I feel like, you know, like you said, as we've all had that opportunity to kind of like step back, um, take a breather from that go-go lifestyle because, you know, in fashion, in entertainment, it was always go-go, like, like almost regardless of what your role was, you were always running to catch up, I felt, or to be relevant or to be competitive. And we were all forced to slow down. And, and I've noticed that I've noticed that people are now they want to know their neighbors pretty much if, if you you know right? like 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 look at it that way they are being more aware of issues they want to support local they i think that fear came in like within us and maybe it was a good thing that fear came in that what's going to happen if we're going to all be shut down if we're all going to be locked down how are we all going to survive that it's forced us to say hey who are the designers down my street essentially mm -hmm. And how can we support them? And how can we support that business? And almost like we got angry that we're not doing enough type mm -hmm. of thing. Uplifting your own community first. Exactly. And, yeah. and I think that's that's one of the positives, like you said, that's that's coming out of COVID is mm -hmm. pushing each other to shine, right? Yes, for sure. So, um, speaking of shine, you have this very absolutely amazing opportunity for people out there, I am excited for you and for what where this is gonna go. Um, talk to us a bit about the Leslie Hampton Award, which is in partnership with the with the Ontario Mining Association. How did how did that all come together? What does that mean to you? I'm like super awake right now. <laughs> I just like want to hear this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so, given my international background, uh, that was uh, because of my family's. Uh, background in, in the mining industry. Um, so the Ontario Mining Association uh, found us a few years ago and have been incredibly supportive within our brand and within myself, uh, with myself as an individual. Um, and we, d during COVID, we were able to figure out how we could uh, continue to uplift our community and push, uh, push forward for perhaps an, a future designer that follows my footsteps uh, with decolonizing fashion and, and making, uh, continuing it uh, forward with inclusivity and diversity. Um, so we were able to put together the Leslie Hampton Award, um, like you said, in partnership with the Ontario Mining Association. Um, and it's a $10,000 award uh, that will be gifted to a, an Indigenous student that's going to be entering Ryerson University in the School of Fashion. Um, and it'll support them across their, their four years of education um, and their entire uh, university career. Um, so I think that's really interesting and exciting because Ryerson's doing really incredible things right now, um, supporting indigenous students um, and supporting uh, the decolonization of, of the fashion industry. Um, and I, I can't wait to see where it goes. I can't wait to be able to mentor and also learn from uh, the student who will receive this award um, and, and really see where they go in the next next few years and uh, in their lifetime. I, I, I love it and I love it because the focus is Ontario. Like 
as much as you know i appreciate and i think it's so big hearted of designers of people who are doing so much for the world in general but the fact that you're narrowing it down and focusing you know in ontario because um, one of the things i've always said is that there's so much talent here but mm-hmm. sometimes it's just things like support like money like that funding that we don't always get so we become in the cycle that we're trying to get out of something but we can't then we're like hustling 10 jobs to make one thing happen so the fact that you're doing this and you're focusing on ontario to try and give that support mm-hmm. i i i see this being as one of the biggest game changers within not only like within our province but like within our with our like within our um industry definitely wow. yeah. yeah yeah i can't wait to see where it goes um and the success of it might lead to to more funding and being able uh, for allowing us to perhaps support uh, who knows how many students in the future. Um, and the, the hard work that uh, Indigenous student perhaps who is currently located in Northern Ontario, the, the track to come down to Toronto and not only establish your academic career, but your personal life in, in the city um, would be such a such a a big journey and a big adventure for them um, that it's just exciting to see where it goes and, and anywhere I can support with with the brand that I've built so far, uh, I'm honored to. So before we quick go into our next break, um, we have a few seconds here and I really want to understand, um, just again for the benefit of the listeners, how did, how did you decide to move into this idea of the award partnership with the Ontario Mining Association uh, out of all organizations that are, are possible? Like how did that partnership come together? Um, they, uh, the Ontario Mining Association and the individuals involved, uh, in in their sponsorship, uh, supported us, uh, for our last showcase, um, uh, and we were able to put together our copper dress, uh, because of their support. Nice. Um, and it was an eight pound dress completely made of copper, like actual copper, uh, leafing that I embossed and then sewed onto this dress. Uh, it weighed eight pounds. It was very um, heat conductive. So on the runway, it wasn't the best. Right. <laughs> the model. She got very warm. Um, but the the journey uh, creating that dress um, and the amazing support that the Ontario Mining Association uh, allowed us to to go back to our roots and, and mm-hmm. develop that creative side uh, and um, concept uh, providing side uh, into into a fashion garment and then see that garment on, on the runway was really incredible. So it was, it was a really easy decision to continue to work with them and, and push forward. Absolutely. Rashi, you want to take us into our break? <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, hey, everybody, we are chatting with like Leslie Hampton. We're going to take a quick break and be right back. Hi, everyone. I'm Stylist Rashi Bindra. Do not forget to follow us on Instagram as Elevated Grapes and show some love. And guys, we are back with the fabulous, inspiring, my mind is still blown, Leslie Hampton. And uh, we're so honored to have her with us. And um, Leslie, what I wanted to ask you was, you've done so many shows and so many exhibitions, and they have been international, like so many cities. Um, Which has been your favorite and why? (laughs) Right out of my fashion school graduation, um, uh, in partnership with Vancouver Fashion Week, I was able to travel to uh, Korea, to Seoul, to uh, do a presentation there. Um, And that was really exciting because I brought my mom and my dad with me. That's Um, awesome. (laughs) And that was the first time out of, well, first time traveling out of fashion school, but also one of the first times uh, doing such a trip, such a major trip like that um, after my international upbringing. So Mm -hmm. it was kind of cool to uh, have my dad give me that incredible upbringing and then um, almost like returning the favor and being able to bring him along with me now to my my work experience. Um, So that was really, that was fun and an exciting experience because I would have never thought that I uh, would have traveled to to a country like that um, so that, that was really cool um, and then also uh, I had the opportunity to go to London Fashion Week with the Toronto Fashion Incubator Canadian Collections um, and do a showcase at Canada House in, in a Trafalgar Square 
um, in, wow. in downtown London. And that was really exciting because as a teenager growing up in London, um, when I spent my high school years there, uh, Trafalgar Square is just kind of where I hung out and, <laughs> and like walked around with my friends. So it was yeah. funny to then go back there as a professional and be working in the same space that, that it was kind of my stomping ground. Brings it, brings it full circle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I was actually able to, while I was there, go back and visit my high school and do that experience. Wow. That some people take for granted when they live down the street from their high school, but going <laughs> from a different country, it's really exciting to just ex re-explore that, that and, and have those memories. So explain your, your parents. Ex uh, yeah, I was about to just ask that. Really, really enjoyed the fact they got to do that with you. <laughs> It was, it was kind of odd because we don't know any Korean at all when we did go <laughs> to Seoul. So just all three of us really not knowing um, how to communicate with anybody. Uh, we were well taken care of with the uh, Vancouver Fashion Week team. Um, so <laughs> so, but, but just to like go in and, and check into a hotel was, it was a crazy experience um, uh, for that. And then, yeah, yeah. yeah and then uh, similarly with with uh, bringing my mom to back to London with us. It was just really funny to, we almost fell into our old ways, riding the tube and <laughs> having that slight British accent that just comes out. Um, so it, it was really exciting uh, for all of us. So sorry, did you say you have a slight British accent that comes out? Ooh, uh, when I'm in the particular location, <laughs> yeah. I pick up on the phrases really easily. Um, so, and I, when I was living in Australia, because I was so, so young, I, I picked up a lot of the, they have a different, almost a different language down there with the the slang that they use. So yeah, they do, yeah. as a 14 year old kid, <laughs> picking all that up and being very uh, malleable there, it was really funny to to just go back into that type of, that type of funny. So what, what you're basically telling us is sometimes even in regular conversation, it'll pop out and you won't, and you won't flinch because it's just- <laughs> Yeah, certain inflections <laughs> thing, really funny to- Yeah. Be in a on, a on the dining room table with our family because yeah, yeah. <laughs> where it just pops out and we're all like huh we all make fun of each other after <laughs> that's so great about your experiences right like being like you you know indonesia and, and and australia and the uk like having all these places to have spent so much of like your time and it's not just you were visiting a for a one-week trip like you're spending time there so you picked up on a lot of the cultural the slang like all these sort of things it's not just the, from the fashion and, and schooling and all that kind of stuff is is part of your passion but to get all these extra things out of these experiences is is what like is what makes it so wholesome too yeah the good bad and the ugly too because even when my mom was in indonesia uh she went through a went through an earthquake there and and uh oh my goodness survived that and survived certain bombings that happened in, in uh, oh, wow. jakarta so to have those experiences as well as like our, our family stories is kind of weird but uh really kind of made me who i am I'd love to love to sit down with like your family one day, just kind of hear their and just like hear <laughs> all of this. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god! It's things like we we wouldn't even see living in Canada, right? So yeah. Um. Yeah. So talk to us next. What's next about? Sorry, next. What's next with you? Uh, and the brand in, in specific. Like, where where do you where do you see as your brand going next? What's the long term outlook for it? What do you want to accomplish now with with the Leslie Hampton brand? Absolutely. Um. So I we're looking to release our next collection in uh, March or April. And my collection is mainly gonna be uh, athletic wear. Um, I still think everyone's gonna be kind of feeling that work from home vibe. So we're kind of gonna base uh, that collection on that. But the colors of the collection are gonna be very bright and happy um, because I think this winter has been really difficult for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and if we can express some happiness, at least through our clothing, even if we're not feeling it 100% yet, um, I think that's that's a great way to start and kind of come out of this uh, bubble isolation that we're in. Um, and then fingers crossed that we do get the vaccine and we are able to possibly attend events again in, in September or towards the end of the year. Uh, we are planning on releasing um, this uh, another signature collection that will include the evening wear and this uh, occasion wear items mm -hmm. um and to get really playful with that uh is going to be exciting because i think again people who have been maybe herbening who, who will be attending that first event or first outing uh will want to will want to show off and and, and uh, glam up so that's kind of what we're thinking for the next year um and then from there i'm really not sure uh i'm still still planning that that five-year ten-year plan because whatever we had planned pre-covid really isn't 
it's yeah. not following the same path that it was. So uh, the rest is still in the works, but it's exciting to see kind of where it goes. And uh, I think once we're out of this, this COVID times, um, I'll, I'll be able to plan more and, and see how we can continue to push diversity, inclusivity in fashion uh, and media. Mm-hmm. That's key. That's yeah. very key. Like to bring that awareness out and just, you know, even with even going back into some sort of global world, uh, keeping all like all what you have worked towards, all what you've been standing for, like during COVID, you know, still fresh in people's mind and it's not something they like forget. Exactly. So where can we find you? What, like, where can our listeners find you? Your like socials, website, where do they find you? I mean, and we will drop all of this in our description, but please say it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my website is lesliehampton.com, uh, L-E-S-L-E-Y hampton.com. Um, you can shop our collections on there, get to know me a little more um, and see, see past collection items. Um, my Instagram and TikTok are Leslie underscore Hampton. Uh, my, I'm new to TikTok, so go give me a follow on there. <laughs> what, um, what, Twitter what, what is- What do people expect on your, on your TikTok? What are, they, what, are you, what are you gonna showcase on there? Oh, it's a range of things right now. It's, it's my travel. I have a, a TikTok about the Korea trip. Um, nice. Traveling, a uh, few trends. Um, TikTok trends that I'm trying out, not the best at. I might include some dancing videos soon if Uh-oh. I have to record them. <laughs> we will see. Um, <laughs> and then uh, pieces of the collection and behind the scenes of, nice. of, wor- of working in the studio um, and kind of the day to day of of what we are uh, is going to be all over on the on the TikTok. Um, and then so Twitter is uh, at Leslie Hampton, um, and then you can always Google me and find me from there. Absolutely. So just basically look up Leslie Hampton and you'll find it. It's, <laughs> and it's, find yeah. everything. <laughs> yes. L-E-S, yeah. uh, L E S L E Y. So yes. just make sure you get that spelling right. Yes. If you don't get it right, it's going to go to a mom in the U.S. who okay. won't, <laughs> <laughs> won't expect all the follows. That, that poor mom. <laughs> She's probably getting so many hits. <laughs> awesome. Well, Leslie, thank you so much for, for taking the time to share your story. It is quite uh, incredible and quite inspirational. Um, just everything from the beginning, you know, when you first started talking about your your travels and the experiences through that and, and to the work you're doing with the awards and helping to build the fashion industry in Canada, um, really, un- especially Ontario, really incredible stuff. Um, so thank you for A, doing it and B, sharing it thank with you. us. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for having me and letting Absolutely. me share. Likewise. Thanks so much. And to so our listeners, thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to Elevated Grapes with Leslie Hampton. Again, look her up online, socials, Leslie Hampton. And uh, you'll be able to find more of her story there. And we will see you next week. Hey, guys. Thank you for watching that podcast or that video. Um, If you like what you hear and you want to hear more of us and see some of our behind-the-scenes stuff, subscribe below. Yes, hit that little red, like, you know, button thingy that's over there. And hit subscribe and keep following us for a lot more cool, fun stuff. Thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you soon. Hey, what's up, everyone? I am your host, Sethi. I am stylist Rashi Bindura. Elevated Grapes is a digital media hub that includes a talk show, event correspondence, and digital hosting for partner projects. The talk show which you are listening to or watching, depending on what you're doing, covers topics in fashion, business, and lifestyle. We regularly have incredible guests that share their stories, their experiences, and tips on the above topics. And when we don't, you get to hear how we talk to each other off air. So subscribe to your favorite streaming site, YouTube, and Instagram for behind the scenes and additional visual content. Let's jump right into the show. Welcome to Elevated Graves.